That's my motor pool you're looking at. Not too shabby, is it? Well, it's that way because everyone here has come to recognize that in our line of work, the first requirement is to keep the place neat and clean. As you well know, in a maintenance area, you deal with a lot of substances that can really be a problem if they're handled in a sloppy way. You know, mess up the environment. We make every effort not to do that around here. I'm the guy in charge of this place, Sergeant First Class Ben Logan. A few years ago, the guy started calling me Little Bit, Little Bit Logan, and the name's kind of stuck. But that's okay with me because every time they call me Little Bit, they're reminded of the first lecture I gave them when they came to the unit. Every new soldier gets it. I call it my every little bit hurt speech. It sets up the reasons why my motor pool looks the way it does and operates the way it does. And it all has to do with good maintenance operations and preserving the quality of our environment. The air we breathe, the food we eat, the water we drink. And I always get their attention by starting off talking about something big that's messed up the environment. You know, like the Valdez Alaskan oil spill. It's easy to talk about the importance of keeping the environment clean when you focus on something as big as a huge tanker leaking millions of gallons of oil and polluting hundreds of miles of beautiful waterways and coastlines. Most of the soldiers I have working here for me like to fish and hunt, and they can really get upset when something like a big oil spill happens. What's harder for some of them to understand is that a little spill can cause a lot of trouble with the environment, too. It's just not as obvious. Transmission fluid or cleaning solvents spilling into a drain can wind up in a creek that feeds a community's water supply and make that water unfit to drink. Even a little bit poured out on the ground can seep down and pollute the water in people's wells. Containers with leftover oil and many other waste materials thrown into a trash bin can wind up in a landfill, and the liquids can seep down into the soil below. That can pollute the community's water supply, too. At first, the response I get is, oh, come on, Sarge, how can a little bit of oil or solvent hurt anything? And that's when I let them have it. I tell them, little bit? Well, you know something? One gallon of oil can pollute well over a million gallons of drinking water. Every little bit hurts. It can hurt the water we drink, and depending on what it is we don't handle right, it can hurt the food we eat and the air we breathe. And then I let them have it again. I say, you don't have to believe it if you don't want to, but in my motor pool, you're going to act like you believe it for three reasons. One, it's good for the environment. Two, I say so. Three, it's the law. There's a federal law called the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. Most people call it RICRA and it concentrates on the proper handling of wastes that are hazardous to land, air, or water, and could cause injury or death to individuals. In short, RICRA defines what wastes are hazardous. About 450 of them have been listed by the Environmental Protection Agency. And then RICRA spells out how these wastes should be handled, stored, and disposed. The law also says that non-listed wastes are considered hazardous if they are reactive, that is, if they are unstable and can explode when they come in contact with water or other liquids. If they are ignitable, that is, if they will easily catch on fire. If they are corrosive, if they will dissolve metal or irritate the skin. Or if they are toxic, that is, pose a health hazard to humans. Some toxics might contain mercury, arsenic, cadmium, or lead. In a motor pool such as ours, items such as used solvents, used paint thinners, contaminated fuels, and battery acids fall into these categories and must be handled very carefully. Remember, a hazardous waste is a used hazardous material collected for disposal. Hazardous wastes must be collected on site and disposed of through a carefully structured system carried out by the Installation Environmental Office and the Defense Reutilization and Marketing Office, DRMO. DRMOs accepts waste from activities such as motor pools, arrange for recycling them where possible, 
and controls how they are disposed. Our job in the motor pool is simple. We do what the law says where hazardous wastes are concerned. When we do, we avoid letting even a little bit pollution loose into the environment. In short, we obey the law. Now you may have noticed that I didn't mention engine oil or antifreeze when I talked about hazardous waste found in motor pools. That's because they're considered hazardous waste in some states, not all. Your shop standard operating procedure will tell you whether it's considered hazardous in your state. But no matter where you are, these must be handled carefully because of their ability to pollute drinking water and otherwise harm the environment. And get this, used engine oil can become a hazardous waste anywhere if hazardous waste is added to it. For example, suppose you dispose of a solvent such as PD680 type 1 or MEK in a drum used to store waste oil. This is a violation of the regulations. Solvents are considered hazardous, including those that are petroleum based. So all the liquid in the drum could become a hazardous waste. And that's a problem. Let me tell you why. First, used oil that isn't contaminated with hazardous waste may be used as a fuel in your local boiler plant if your state allows it or it could be recycled but it can't be burned when it contains a hazardous waste it has to be disposed of by the DRMO and disposal of hazardous waste is getting increasingly difficult and expensive it's just common sense that anyone who handles hazardous materials should minimize their use First, you should always check to see if there's a substitute you can use that isn't a hazardous material or is less hazardous. Obviously, the less hazardous material we use, the less hazardous waste we're going to generate. And the less hazardous waste we have to contend with, the easier it is to comply with the law. The less chance we have to pollute the environment, the safer it is for you and your workplace, and the less expensive it is to dispose of it. So. And my motor pool minimization of hazardous waste is SOP. Order only what you use and use only what you need. Use the oldest materials first and don't stockpile hazardous materials. It only causes problems. Now, what about storage of the waste we do generate? Every waste must have its own container. This is really important. Oil in one, solvent in another, transmission fluid in another, and so on. I've already explained why you should not contaminate your used oil, but it's also important not to mix certain other materials together. For instance, waste oil and STB can become reactive. We don't want any reactions like this happening around here. Also, certain materials mixed together can become extremely corrosive, thereby causing the container to leak fluid more easily. Separate your waste material. Now what about the condition of the containers? Be sure any container you use is in good condition and isn't rusty or dented. Don't put the drums directly on the ground because the moisture will promote rusting. Chances are good that a rusty container will leak, if not right away, then later. Be sure all the containers are kept closed except when you're filling or emptying them. That's part of the law. And be sure that they are properly labeled. Careful and correct labeling is especially important when you handle hazardous waste. You want to make sure that each container is clearly identified with the waste it contains. This is important for your safety. Waste storage containers should be located properly, outside and out of the way of motor pool traffic and equipment. We don't want any of our vehicles backing into one of these drums and causing a spill. If the waste is ignitable or reactive, the container should be removed as far as possible from the shop floor. This may be an inconvenience when it comes to using the container, but this is minor compared to the extra protection provided by the isolated location should a spill or ignition occur. All waste containers, whether isolated or not, should have some sort of secondary containment. This is one type.
Here is another. Any system is okay as long as it catches and contains any spills that might occur while filling or emptying the container or if a leak occurs. Here are several other frequently used secondary containment methods. All of them are effective in preventing spills from harming the environment. Keep in mind that spills in the secondary containment must be cleaned up and spill residue disposed of properly. Used batteries present a special waste problem. The preferred disposal methods in the Army is to turn them into the DRMO wet so they can be recycled. This eliminates the possibility of creating an unnecessary hazardous waste problem when you empty out the battery acid. The trouble is, some DRMOs don't accept used wet batteries. If that's the case in your area, then you'll have to check your motor pool's SOP. Your DRMO and your local environmental officer will have worked out a satisfactory procedure for disposing of batteries. If your SOP calls for emptying the acid out of the batteries, be sure to use non-metallic containers that won't corrode or rust. Now let me show you something else that can pollute the environment if you're not careful. Here's a container of brake fluid. It's been opened, most of it's been used, but there's still a little bit inside. How do you handle it? Throw it in a trash bin? not on your life. If you did that, the container would wind up in a landfill with all the rest of the trash. The fluid would spill out. Eventually, it would seep down into the ground, and then it would possibly pollute the local drinking water and maybe even affect the food that people around here eat. There's no chance of that happening when you handle leftover waste properly. Empty the can in the proper waste storage container, then and only then crush the container, if required, and throw it in the trash bin or place into a recycling bin. You know, all too often where equipment is being maintained, people will tend to just throw away the small quantities of leftover liquids without any thought of what it can do to the environment. It happens out on the flight line. A pilot takes a fuel sample, and then what does he do with it? It's only a little bit, he says to himself, and he throws it out on the ground. That's not right. <laughs> a little bit of gasoline or any other liquid should be disposed of properly. That applies to anyone involved in maintenance of equipment, aircraft, tracked vehicles, wheeled vehicles, anything. Waste should never be dumped on the ground. Even just a little bit is wrong. There is no excuse for any deliberate or careless disposal of hazardous waste or any material that has the potential to damage the environment. Now, let's talk about disposal of the hazardous waste you generate. There's a set procedure for maintenance facilities to follow. It varies from place to place, so you'll have to check your local SOP. Mainly, it involves making sure the filled container of waste is properly identified and a turn-in document, typically a 1348-1, is filled out. The installation then fills out a hazardous waste manifest form when the waste leaves the installation. This manifest form is designed so shipments of hazardous waste can be tracked from its point of generation to its final destination. Some people say from cradle to grave. Okay, now we've talked about some basic rules for protecting the environment. First, minimize the use of hazardous materials and waste. Order only what you need and use only what you need. Rotate stock. Don't stockpile hazardous materials. You'll only be creating problems for your motor pool. Don't mix hazardous waste with those that are not classified as hazardous. This is a violation of the law. When you do, the entire mixture could become hazardous and disposal becomes a problem. There's a chance you won't be able to use it as a boiler fuel. Don't mix different hazardous waste together. When you do, you make recycling difficult or even impossible, and you make disposal more expensive. Empty original containers of hazardous materials before you throw them away. You don't want even a little bit of hazardous waste dripping out into a landfill. Finally, make sure you do all you can to prevent and contain spills. Have the necessary equipment on hand if a spill should happen. Be careful when you are handling hazardous materials so you don't cause a spill. Be careful when you dispose of waste in your shop waste container. 
read the label, and use the proper waste container. Don't mix waste. Be sure all waste storage drums have secondary containment in case you have an accidental spill. And be sure you follow the correct turn-in procedures when a storage container is spilled. Following these procedures has helped my motor pool keep spills to a minimum. But we all know no matter how hard we try, accidents will happen and we're ready if they do. We have a standard operating procedure to handle spills so we contain them right here in the motor pool. We have the equipment we need to stop the spread of spills and clean them up. And I've made sure my guys know what to do. Rule number one, protect yourself. Rule number two, stop the spill. Rule number three, contain the spill. Rule number four, report the spill. We also have a reporting procedure to follow if the spill involves a hazardous material or waste. In our case, we call the proper authorities as soon as possible after we've contained the flow of the spill. All the proper emergency numbers are posted right in the motor pool. You know, all it takes to operate a maintenance shop the right way is good common sense, plus an understanding of why it's important not to let any one little bit of any potential pollutant, used oil, solvent, any type of hazardous waste, anything, escape into the environment. My soldiers understand all that. They do use good common sense, they know the correct procedure to follow to minimize the use of hazardous materials and the generation of hazardous waste. They know how to prevent accidents or spills, and they know what to do should an accident occur. My people know that if there's any question about the right way to operate, all they have to do is ask me, Little Bit Logan. They know I'll set them straight. If you have any questions about handling the waste you create on the job, Check your unit's SOP, ask your supervisor or your unit's environmental officer, NCO, or see the post environmental officer. He can usually be found at the DEH. We're all here to help you do your job right and protect the environment. <laughs>